Um, so, my name's Kerry Davis. Uh, I'm the outgoing Student Union President for Cardiff University Student Union. Um, and uh, I'm Elliot Howells, I'm the incoming president of the Students' Union. Um, and we're here with Neil Kinnock, uh, Lord Neil Kinnock, uh, who was president of University College Cardiff in 1965. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we've got a few questions for you. Obviously, um, Cardiff, Students' Union, the city has changed a lot since, since you were president. How, how is it different uh, when you come back, and do you come back often? I'm back fairly frequently in Cardiff for a variety of reasons, um, sporting, political, uh, seeing friends. But the huge change that's taken place as far as the university is concerned is obviously that this is a university, full-blown now, giving its own degrees, whereas we were a constituent college of the University of Wales. And this university is about eight times as big as it was when I was a student in the early 1960s. Other than that, students are always students, uh, impecunious, uh, always short of cash, and tragically weighed now by burdens of debt that we couldn't even dream of them. I mean, people used to go into the red occasionally by even a couple of hundred quid, but the kind of burden that modern-day students, graduates, and postgraduates carry around is gigantic and entirely wrong. Of course, it shouldn't be like that, and it, in my view, needn't be like that. But that's another story. The city, the city has sprawled more. The city has become hugely modernized in some respects, like the shopping center, uh, a real stride in the direction of progress. The same goes for Cardiff Bay. But in other respects, the loss of really the grit of Cardiff, Tiger Bay, and some of the older parts of the city, uh, that was avoidable, entirely unnecessary if there'd been sympathetic planning. Facades could have been maintained, the vitality of those places could have been sustained, the community could have remained intact in instead of being dispersed to the fringes of the city at huge expense and great inconvenience for the people themselves, with a couple of decades uh, of social difficulty as a consequence. So obviously a great deal of it is genuine progressive development, real progress. But in the course of doing that, especially at the velocity at which Cardiff has done it, um, you lose them things which were of value and thoughtlessly were simply overruled, put aside, demolished. And that's, I guess that's an old man talking, but I think anybody reviewing that five decades would say we could have had the progress without losing any of the, if you like, cultural warp and weft. I mean, I don't let distance lend enchantment. Some of it was slum and it deserved to come down but not all of it. Thank you. Um, obviously, a few years after graduating, uh, you became an MP, and then a little over a decade after that, uh, you were leader of the Labour, Labour Party. Um, would you say that your time as president and your experiences of student politics as a whole uh, were like the springboard to your success in Westminster? Yeah, what you're describing is a midlife crisis sta <laughs> starting very early, yeah. Um, <coughs> yes, it was, uh, definitely. Uh, it was while I was student president, and I was also president of the so Social Society. And as a consequent, consequent, met a very beautiful young woman from North Wales, who I talked into becoming my replacement as secretary of the Social Society so that I could chair it, uh, Glynis Parry, uh, who is now Baroness Kinnock, in her own right. She's not there because she's my wife. She's there because she was Minister of State in the Foreign Office and a damn good one, too. Um, while I was president, uh, it became clear to others, and also, if I confess it to me, that I really had an aptitude um, for communicating and, more important, for representing people. And so <coughs> we got married uh, the um, spring after we both uh, got our teacher certificates, having graduated the year before, and went to move uh, to live in Blackwood, uh, an area where I thought the constituency MP was in his late 50s. And he turned out to be in his late 60s. So the skills that I 
certainly honed as a student representative, active in national politics as well, um, stood me in good stead when I went for selection in uh, the second safest Labour seat in the country, never expecting to, and with the support of a lot of lifetime friends, great comrades, I got selected and then elected at the age of 28. Now, I couldn't have done that had I not developed these capabilities in the years that I was in Cardiff University. And that taught me another lesson. So when I became leader of the Labour Party, in appalling circumstances, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Well, maybe I, maybe I would wish it on my worst enemy, because <laughs> it was cruel and unnatural punishment. It was leaving the Labour Party at any time isn't, isn't a joyride, but then it was absolute bloody purgatory. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I then put into my private office people who had one thing in common, and that is they'd either been presidents of the National Union of Students or secretaries of the National Union of Students or they'd run big students' unions. And when I used to be challenged over this about having a bunch of kids running the office, I used to say, you tell me how else in the United Kingdom anybody by the age of 22, 23 will have experience of running a multi-million pound uh, operation with... Uh, shareholders who can call a meeting <laughs> at an afternoon's notice and are generally drunk when they do it <laughs> and maintain order and show a profit. The opportunity does not otherwise exist. And people with the inclination towards organization and representation who are prepared to be accountable and creative, they were the people I wanted to work for me. And they included, of course, Charles Clark, of course, Patricia Hewitt, uh, of course, uh, Lord Equal, John Equal, uh, and several other people who had themselves run or been senior officials, accountable officials, elected to lead students' unions. And they were, everybody will acknowledge, they're probably the best team that any leader of the opposition from any party has ever had. You, um, you spoke a bit about uh, the fact that you know, stakeholders can, can call a meeting at any time and, and it puts you in a kind of a precarious position. So what were some of the, the major difficulties you faced um, in, in your time in office? I, I'm doomed. One of my biographers has developed a thesis that I was born to reform. <laughs> I reformed the Prefects Council when I was in grammar school. I then came to Cardiff and... <clears throat> The students' union, although a major responsibility and uh, uh, obviously developing its turnover and becoming quite a significant business, was not really subject, uh, other than, than the excellent house officer that we had, administrator, with lots of experience in the hotel business. She was brilliant. But outside that, um, there was a kind of pride in amateurism. And I was very fortunate. Uh, the staff rep on the students uh, on the House Committee was uh, a young lecturer from the engineering department and was, became a great mate of mine. And uh, between us, when I was House Secretary and then President, we started to make it less amateur. Organizing the bar, which was relatively new, it was only three years old when I became, or it was two years old when I became House Secretary, uh, so that there was a proper system of accounting and auditing, which had been lacking. And it turned from being a loss maker, which is incredible. How the hell do you make a loss in a student bar? Uh, especially with markups, like I introduced, to discourage certain patterns of drinking. We, had, we were running markups of 60%. You can't make a loss in those circumstances. But we turned it around. <clears throat> and it became a source of major revenue for the students' union. We did the same uh, revenue spinning in several other spheres, including having films on Sunday when no cinemas were open in Wales. Can you imagine it? Anyway, um, so that was a main task, reorganizing the finances of the students' union. Then the union leadership was not accountable. So I introduced uh, a constituency system for elections to the Students' Representative Council, which made things much better, got us much better talent in, apart from anything else. 
then there was relations with the college. Um, we had no representation on the, the Senate, uh, and very, very few universities had the students on the Senate or Council or equivalent. And others agitated, there was uproar, sit-ins, and God knows what. We did it in an afternoon's negotiation uh, with a very cooperative bunch of people who were running the university or the college. Um, so we got that representation. And because of the security of finance that we brought, uh, it meant that we were able to invest in facilities of various kinds, especially on the revenue account, as it were, um, strip and travel facilities for sports teams, yeah. debating teams, ballroom dancing team. I'm on the ballroom uh, dancing team. Oh, oh right, okay. <laughs> oh, well, we, we invented it. You can congratulate Thanks. yourself. It's <laughs> about 51 years old. Um, and uh, those kinds of changes that then become possible because you've got financial viability. It's very, very important. It also gives you a degree of independence, which is vital for decision making and enhances the accountability. We introduced proper auditing, for instance, changes like that. So a lot of the changes had a cumulatively beneficial effect on the union. Some of them had appeared in my manifesto seeking election, some of them more, more subtle and required day-to-day -day diplomacy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, obviously, Carrie and I uh, ran in uh, cross-campus elections for, for these positions, and our elections are uh, quite gimmicky, we'll say. Uh, so, for example, um, with my name, I ran under the campaign of uh, Ellie Bean for president and dressed up as a bag of jelly beans and handed up jelly beans. <coughs> How does that That would have guaranteed you defeat in my day. <laughs> students were a lot more straight-laced. <laughs> yeah. How does that compare, then, to, to your experience of elections? Did, um, did students... Yeah, uh, before I got elected... The only uh, campaigning feature uh, was word of mouth gossip and a hustings. And that had only been a couple of years before because people were much more usually chosen on the basis of their prowess in the very, very well attended student debating society on Friday nights, which used to be packed out. And I did all that, but. Um, uh, I decided that we should have a straightforward campaign. Uh, we cut our teeth, of course, on the 1964 general election campaign because we had a huge student team from a very big socialist society in Cardiff. Uh, the first time I tried it, of course, I, I made the mistake of getting more drunk than I'd ever been in my life or been since and making a bit of a joyful exhibition myself <laughs> in in the, the president's ball. And that was looked upon with great disfavor by large parts of the student body. And it meant that Pavel uh, ran against me as a virtual unknown and on a very low turnout. She got elected with a majority of, I don't know, about 100 or something. So that taught me a lesson. Be sober, be upright, all the clean shoes, have a crease in your trousers, and do not get wiped out. <laughs> within living memory of a student union election. So the next year, we had a much higher turnout. I, it was around about 60%. And I won with a massive majority. It was just gigantic because we organized, canvassed properly, uh, had impromptu meetings in the various common rooms uh, and uh, in the bar and so on. That was uh, fairly lively, as well as the Hastings. So it improved the turnout. Uh, it meant that a hell of a lot more people who voted knew who I was and what team I was seeking to put forward. <coughs> and then uh, that's how the elections happened. They were not party political at all. Everybody knew who I was, where I came from, and the fact that I was going to try to introduce student democratic socialism, which I think I did with the kind of reforms that we made and the improved finances and so on, and the increased accountability. But uh, if anybody had campaigned as the Labour candidate, let alone the jelly bean candidate, forget <laughs> it, forget it. Uh, you couldn't have campaigned as the rugby club candidate and got elected. Uh, anybody who gave the appearance that they would be politically partisan or partisan for a particular constituency or interest in the university couldn't stand a chance. Avril won because she wasn't me. 
And she was very good. She was very, very good. And very businesslike and very brisk, terrific. Um, ably assisted by a magnificent house secretary, of course. <coughs> Moi. And, um, uh, but she did, she did very, very well. And she taught me a hell of a lesson. And I've never forgotten it. A bit of a life lesson then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, we spoke earlier about how uh, students tend to face a lot more debt now um, when they come to university. Uh, we also have problems like so like housing, um, having homes that are fit for students to live in uh, whilst they're studying. What were the main kind of social issues um, when students were, were students in... in housing was basic. There was a student accommodation officer who rejoiced in the name of Handel Morgan. You can guess what students made of that name. Um, and... Uh, he was a very pleasant, well-disposed man, former student president, actually, of the union. Very nice man, but a little bit otherworldly. And it meant that um, the standards that should have been enjoyed as normal were not enjoyed by everybody. I mean, the student uh, residential halls were fine, but they accommodated less than 20% of the students. And everything else was in the market. And this was a time of dreadful uh, landlord um, abuse. It was the time of Rachman. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Overcrowding, overcharging. <coughs> and of course, if a student with a black face turned up, there were lots of places in Cardiff that they didn't get any kind of welcome. So there was uh, certainly uh, a a degree of racism, there was certainly exploitation, and there was not adequate supervision of the standard of, uh, of places to live. Some were terrific. In fact, the Western Mail did a feature on Glenis, my girlfriend, and myself. She had a, a, a flat in Kyrwin Drive in Lakeside with jean plan furniture and parquet floors, which was terrific because the people who owned it were lecturers in the RAF college in Cranwell, and so they only needed it during university recesses, which was perfect. I, meanwhile, featured in the Western Mail article as the uh, student with the worst flat in Cardiff. It was uh, two rooms, which I shared with two other guys, uh, above uh, the um, People's Theatre in Fitzalan Place, which doesn't exist any longer, when our successor tenants ripped the wallpaper that we'd put on the wall, uh, and we'd gone around the Labour Party in Cardiff getting anybody's spare ends of wallpaper, so this wa these walls were just entirely different bits of wallpaper. When they tore the wallpaper off, out of good taste, I guess, the wall fell down. That's how bad it was. I mean, it was rotten with damp, and the only source of heat was the gas oven in the kitchen. So that used to be roaring at all times. And it was, it was dreadful. The only compensation was I had a four-poster bed, at least. It was uh, a mattress and a base and a four-poster that had been built for a Shakespearean production in the, in the theater. And it also meant we had access to the theater wardrobe. So if in the bitter winter you saw a Russian general coming towards you, <laughs> it was me. And uh, it, it was great. We had this wonderful galaxy of choice of costumes and so on. And the rent was very low. I got chucked out for not paying the rent because I, I stopped paying in protest of the appalling conditions. But it did make an interesting feature. And that was pretty much the spectrum from abysmal, desperate, the kind of place you wouldn't take your parents, not because you'd left it desperately untidy, but because it was uninhabitable and you didn't want them worrying about it, right through to what we used to call uh, Hollywood in Cardiff North. It, the Clarence Drive, it was paradise, and right down the road from the pub, which was perfect. <laughs> and um, great times were had. But housing was always a huge problem. To a very limited extent, debt was a huge problem. Getting pregnant was a devastating problem. Uh, and uh, we developed a system for attempting to support uh, young men and women um, who uh, when they got pregnant. Because in those days, there was a moral pressure from society 
there was an instinct for exclusion, uh, the university was very good. It never stopped anybody continuing a course just because they were pregnant. There were some universities that would do that, not our university. Um, but those kind of social problems and any really bad disruption at home, like the death of a parent or a sibling, uh, or an accidental death of a student, was not only hugely disruptive to people's lives, but there was no really professional counseling service. So was the student medical officer was you know, a decent fellow and well-intentioned and all the rest of it. Um, most of the counseling and the assistance with the unavoidable uh, social problems that come with devastating tragedies of that kind um, were in our hands, really. Uh, I was just fortunate they had a great bunch of student officers. But really, the main soothing and care came from fellow students rather than from any uh, attached or even external experts. And so those kinds of problems had to be endured. The one thing we didn't have was a long-term economic problem. Everybody who came to university and graduated, or some that didn't even graduate, knew they were going to get a job. They absolutely knew and have a choice of jobs. And that really does produce a different, uh, entirely different environment. Um, because it does mean that expectations, provided you put the effort in, really can be fulfilled. And uh, that isn't available for my children's generation. They're in their early 40s now. They both done immensely well, but nevertheless, that wasn't there when they were in university 20, 22 years ago. And it's certainly not available now with the added burdens of death. Um, and I think that uh, as a society, as a, as a polity, regardless of uh, party politics, we've got to do something about that. Because you cannot invite half of the age cohort to go into higher education and promise them the prospect of heaven with higher lifetime earnings and all the rest of it, even though that's true, and then subject them to the kind of pressures, especially the financial pressures, that are commonplace for today's student generation. I don't think it's realistic to, or efficient uh, in terms of marginal cost to do things in this way. There are much better ways to do it. Thank you. That's really fascinating. Um, as a student union president in 2014, uh, uh, the range of responsibilities that we have is, is fairly vast. What was the role of a student union president in 1965? It was just as vast, or we never. <laughs> it didn't. I don't think it ever occurred to anybody to make a list, as it were. <laughs> uh, the buck stopped there, and whatever form the buck took, or how fast or slow it was going, you had to catch it. Um, and I, I don't know if people did it, generally speaking, because of that. I suppose a little bit of me. Uh, the sort of weird political representative thing. Uh, I don't know where that comes from, really. It's in your genes, I guess. Um, uh, that was a challenge I wanted to live up to. Some of my predecessors and successors became student president because they thought, initially, they were going to have a good time. <laughs> the reality soon altered their view <laughs> of that. Uh, and they. Most of them were damn good at the job. Not all of them, but most of them were damn good at the job. And I think that because you had to expect perpetually the unexpected, and because you were accountable on an hour-by-hour -hour basis, so anybody could stop you and ask you, let alone formal things like general meetings and so on, um, you either lived up to that obligation or you died under it. Straightforward as that. And if the student officers simultaneously folded, or the president absconded, unless, uh, uh, as long as they hadn't taken any money with them, um, the union continued, which was OK. And for a period, nobody would really notice the difference. Um, uh, so you know all the time that in order to justify your position as an elected representative, let alone administrator, and if you like, in quotes, governor, of the union, you had to be continually active and available. 
And that doesn't have to be done at any cost. What were the main um, challenges then that the organisation kind of faced, uh, external and, and internal, um, in terms of pressures and, and things? Well, externally, there was this stupid idea that kept on coming along called student loans. And we, we beat it off. Uh, I mean, the National Union of Students annual conference used to be preoccupied with it, rightly so. And we had huge campaigns and so on, and daunted the politicians enough never to introduce it, not for decades afterwards. But it was around them and it was a major challenge. But the other major challenges, frankly, were political. Uh, they were the bomb, they were apartheid, uh, racism, the Vietnam War. Um, and I think because of the unavoidable presence of those huge political challenges, which by definition were young people's challenges. It was young soldiers who were getting killed in Vietnam. And there was a danger at one stage in the mid-60s that Britain could have been sucked into it, so that would be resisted. Uh, the, the campaign for nuclear disarmament was by definition a young people's campaign, even though we had 90-year-old Bertrand Russell leading us. He came to Cardiff to speak to us. He was magical. Talked about sex all the time, didn't talk about the bomb at all. But, uh, I mean, that's why I used to pack out the meetings. Um, and uh, Nelson Mandela had just been uh, tried and sentenced to life imprisonment. Um, the freedom rides were still taking place within seven states of the USA. Martin Luther King had yet to make his I Have a Dream speech. That was the political environment. And, obviously, I was more susceptible to it, as indeed was Glenys than students who didn't take as much interest in politics, but even they knew this was part of the warp and weft of being in your late teens, early 20s, in the early to mid 1960s. We also had two general elections, one in 64, one in 66, after 13 years of conservative rule, with the fourth Earl of Hume as the leader of the Conservative Party. You can imagine what a university like this made of that. So, a lot of the challenges and activity related to the condition of people here and elsewhere in the world and had to be a matter of activity, uh, protest, representation, argumentation for intelligent young people. Don't forget, we were part of less than 3% of the age cohort of 18 to 22 year olds. Big difference from now. So, in a sense, we feel, or at least I felt, and a lot of people like me, obligated to assume these kind of responsibilities. Um, so we did that. In terms of student challenges, as I said earlier, same old, same old. Accommodation, decent living, uh, proper protection for people who got into difficulties for various reasons, uh, finance, but not grotesquely so, like, as it is now, uh, and then things like teaching standards, um, which varied from the utterly brilliant to the utterly appalling. But in those days, much more deferential time in many ways, this stuff about the swinging 60s, don't worry about it. It was great music, but that's about as swinging as it got. Because in terms of overturning <coughs> the established order, the National Service generation had just gone of guys who came to university having done two years in the forces and wouldn't call the king the uncle. They'd just gone. Uh, and so here was the first fresh generation of non-service personnel. It's the first time since the 90, early 1940s that the main body of male students hadn't worn uniform. And that made a terrific difference. So. Uh, any effort that we made to criticize and uh, improve uh, teaching standards was, was met with bafflement, actually. It wasn't even anger or resentment or dismissal. Uh, it was, what right have you got? Because we weren't in any sense thought of as consumers who paid a hell of a lot of money ourselves to go to university. And... Um, 
I mean, that wasn't a huge battlefront, but uh, it used to crop up when people uh, were sitting in lectures and uh, the guy would turn up half cut, half an hour late. Uh, that did lead to complaint. That was usually corrected. And it didn't necessarily mean that they were terribly bad teachers. Sometimes some of them were utterly brilliant under the influence of drink. <laughs> but it, they were different times, different sets of circumstances. And in some ways, the challenges to student representatives are continuous. But in other ways, they move with the generation. And we had some generational issues that you don't have to deal with, and you certainly have got some that, thank God, I never had to deal with. You bet. Um, in your manifesto for president, uh, you said you wanted to improve catering provisions and build a new student union building. Yes. Um, nine years later, this very building was built. Yes, yeah, uh, right. Did, were you involved in the planning of this? Yeah, but we planned a different building. Right. The building that we planned would have cost less than this one, okay. uh, and it would have recovered finance, because I was always very keen on doing that. <coughs> I'm Fiscally nasty is how I was described at one stage. Uh, and the major uh, additional revenue would have come from three floors of very reasonably priced postgraduate apartments that we would have built as part of the union. Uh, and with the opportunity uh, architecturally to put another two floors on top. And that would have meant that um, quite a lot of the basic expenditure what you could call the physical capital of the students' union would have been covered simply by the fact that their rent would have been paid every month by whoever was their public or private sponsoring body. And they would have had a great place to live directly opposite the university. So that would have been terrific. That was left out of the design as it eventually emerged. I wasn't resentful about that. John, uh, my successor, was responsible for agreeing to this design of building. And in the circumstances, I guess he thought he was doing the best thing, uh, even though it cost the taxpayer rather more than ours would have done. Um, and it was actually, at the time, it was slightly smaller than the building that we designed. But um, it had to come. You would not believe the buildings we had as unions. The one just along here, which was a big gym, but where we held the Saturday night hop, that was fine. A couple of uh, seminar rooms above it and the staff dining club above it. Um, that was fine. Um, built them in the early 1950s. Not a bad building for those days. But the other place was um, a not entirely uh, upgraded former Church of England primary school down in Dumfries Place, which had its own charm, uh, but it was also a slum. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was a main source of problems. If you can imagine the main part of your estate <coughs> being in perpetual need of repair, I don't mean the kind of modernizing development you've got going on at the moment. I mean uh, on a cold, Monday morning, <coughs> the whole plumbing system blowing uh, with students coming in and God knows what and lunches to be prepared. Um, and uh, we're fortunate in having a terrifically supportive staff, too small but very supportive. And uh, uh, we faced those kind of challenges simply because we had a building that was 100 years old and had never been properly maintained. Looking forwards, um, we're planning our general election strategy, obviously, general election right. coming up, um, and we're talking about the sorts of things we could be doing as a student union. What do you think, uh, in the current climate, that student unions, or good student unions, should be doing in preparation for the general election? Well, continually, and it's great if you can start now, it's terrific. Continually impressing on students that whether they vote here in Cardiff or at home, their vote really does matter. That democracy is not something to be left to somebody else. Now, it's easy to sound very pi pious about it, but everybody's got to remember that if they don't vote, their government is chosen by other people. Now, they wouldn't let other people choose their iPad or, or, or a pair of tights 
and certainly wouldn't allow them to, uh, to choose their trainers or their haircuts. So why the hell should they let other people choose how their country is governed? And I know it's easy for people, especially in a permanently cynical age, it, this isn't a new phenomenon, to think, oh, nothing I do will make any difference. I'm non-political. I just recite, as I have to do from time to time, the words of Jack London when somebody said <coughs> in one of his novels that they were non-political animals. He said, the non-political animal has no parents and no children, requires neither warmth nor coolness, needs no education or training, seeks neither occupation nor respite, doesn't relax or work, and when the non-political animal dies, he will bury himself. The fact is, it comes in through every crevice, every pore, and you can either try to ignore it and have it run your life, or you can do something about it. So it's the absolute necessity, first and foremost, to use your democratic right to vote, wherever you use it. And secondly, if you can try to inform that vote as much as possible by listening in, not difficult to do in this free country, and making your own judgment, making up your own mind, then you've got the right to call yourself a dependable democratic citizen. If you don't do those things, you're just a passenger, and one that is open to be misrepresented and misruled. So I think it's great if you can use the resource of the union to simply, even subliminally, if you like, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, instill in people the absolute necessity to use their power and their responsibility to vote. Well, I think the line, you wouldn't let someone else choose your haircut, is a great marketing strategy. Well, so. I completely <laughs> agree. Yeah. Uh, I think, I've never used that line before. You got it. <laughs> it's really no good. No copyright, it's okay. <laughs> Thank you ever so much for today. Um, it's been great chatting to you, uh, and I hope I hope you've enjoyed coming back. And um, we can show you around if you like. If you've got time, but I understand you might be in a bit of a rush. Oh, I've got to get busy. Yeah. No problem. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thanks. Very kind. Thanks very much. Thank you.